Okay, let's um, get started. With, with, um, with everything we've learned so far, uh, first law, th second law of thermodynamics, and plus all of the other details, you move today. Yeah. Used to seeing you right there. So, um, <laughs> are you planning on napping? No, I wouldn't if it's close, but I want to nap. <laughs> no, I have people who nap in the front. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, with everything that we have, we can take a good look at a simple power plant, which we have seen before in some of the other lectures. Uh, but let's go ahead and, and analyze some of the components of the power plant in some detail and learn a few things. So you have seen a schematic like this before. It's a, it's a power plant operating in the as a ranking cycle. Remember the ranking cycle uh, as an ideal cycle would be uh, two isotherms, I'm sorry, two isobars and, um, and, and two isentropic uh, processes. Um, if we look, for example, at the uh, isobaric processes, which would be the processes in the boiler and in the condenser, then that essentially defines two pressures, the high pressure of the cycle, which is the pressure in the boiler from two to three, that's an isobaric process, and then the low pressure in the cycle, which is the pressure in the condenser, and that's the pressure uh, from four to one, an isobaric process. And then in the ideal ranking cycle, the uh, processes in the pump and the turbine would be isentropic processes. And so, let's say, for example, that um, we want to look at, in detail at uh, what is happening in the turbine. So suppose, say, let's uh, give in some data as to what's uh, going into the turbine and what's coming out of the turbine. Can we find out how that turbine actually operates and what kind of power, what kind of work we get out of that turbine? And there are several things in, uh, which we can use to approach the problem. One good thing to do, for example, would be to do a, a diagram, a property diagram. And uh, of course, we have uh, different choices as to what we can plot. But let's say, for example, that we decide to plot um, this cycle on a TS diagram. So. temperature uh, entropy. We could also do a temperature volume, which you have seen before. But since we can use entropy, and it's useful because of the nature of the isentropic processes, the two isentropic processes, this will be a valuable thing to plot. So let's say that I do temperature and entropy like this. And the ranking cycle, remember, operates with a mixture of liquid and vapor. When the um, uh, fluid goes into the boiler, it comes in as a liquid, but it comes out as, uh, as a superheated vapor. So the next thing we should do is maybe put the dome in here. So let's say that um, that's our dome. <clears throat> and then put the two isobars that define the, um, the two limits. So we'll have a. A, um, an isobar up here, which is the high, this is the pressure in the boiler. And then we have the low pressure. Which would be the pressure in the condenser. Then typically what happens is that the fluid comes, uh, so the boiler, let's say the boiler is this, this high pressure line. So when it comes out of the boiler, if we use the same, let me put this back here. If we put this back here to guide us, 
uh, the exit of the boiler is three. That typically would be uh, superheated. So let's say that's somewhere here. That's three before it goes into the turbine. And then if, this, if it's an ideal ranking cycle, then the process in the turbine would be isentropic. And because I'm using a, a TS diagram, that process through the boiler, I'm sorry, through the turbine, will then be a vertical line as I drop from the high pressure to the low pressure. So if it is um, isentropic, then it will come straight down until it reaches the low pressure, which is the pressure in the condenser. So this would be my four. And then goes through the condenser at constant pressure. And just for simplicity, let's assume that uh, that when it comes out of the condenser, it is a saturated liquid. So the exit of the condenser, which is one in the um, schematic above, <coughs> would be there. Now I go through the pump. In the ideal ranking cycle, the process through the pump would be uh, isentropic, so it'll be a vertical line. So it will go to there. And that would be two. And then, of course, I go through the boiler, which takes me from two to three at a constant pressure from compressed liquid to superheated vapor. So that would be what this cycle would look like um, on a TS diagram in an ideal situation. Now, in, in a real situation, then uh, the processes that we are labeling as isentropic won't be isentropic anymore uh, because there will be entropy generation. So if, I, if this 3 to 4 is the isentropic case, where, and assuming that is the same entry to the turbine 3, where would the real exit out of the turbine, the real number 4, where would it be located? Since entropy increases, it has to be to the right of the 4 that I put there. And, but it still has to come out at the same pressure. So it will come out somewhere to the right of number 4, but on the same isobar. So it could be still a mixture if it remains inside the dome, but more than likely it might be somewhere out here. So if I relabel this for uh, 4S, which is the standard notation to the node that that's the isentropic exit, then the real exit from the turbine is here, and this is the real number four. So I can maybe draw that with a solid line. That's a real process through the turbine from three to four. Something similar would happen, would happen in the pump. So again, one to two denotes the isentropic process through the pump, but the real process through the pump is not isentropic. There'll be entropy generation, so it'll shift again to the right. So if I relabel these two as 2S, then when it comes out of the real pump, it might be somewhere here. And that's 2. And then I can, that's the real process through the pump. And so let's say that we still have this 2 to 3 is the same, and 4 to 1 is the same. So the solid uh, red line then denotes the real cycle in this uh, TS diagram. OK, so obviously the irreversibilities that take place, for example, in the turbine will have a consequence that is important for us to note. And that's better seen if we do another plot, but let's look at some of the equations first. So let's say that we say, that we decide, let's, let's look at the turbine process in detail. So let's get this out of the way. Maybe leave that there since I have room here. And um, write some equations for the process in the turbine. Okay. So 
we'll make some assumptions. We'll assume that this power plant is operating in steady state. So we can use the steady state version of the equations. So there is no transient variation. The whole plant is operating continuously. So if I uh, write the first law, For this turbine, <laughs> remember the left-hand side is the transient term, so that's zero because there is no variations inside. Let me actually write the um, uh, full equation down here, I guess. Well, I think I'll, yeah, I probably won't have space there. So I would have D, uh, if, I, if I take the total energy uh, or if I take only the internal energy, depends on whether I decide to neglect kinetic energy and potential energy changes. Let's say we do that, that we neglect those. Uh, so then this would be the left-hand side. This is for the control volume, which of course in my case is the turbine. So I'm crossing that out. There is uh, no transient variation. And then this would be equal to Q dot through the turbine. So that's, of course, uh, 3 to 4. Q dot 3 to 4 minus W dot 3 to 4. And then the enthalpy terms. So I would have the mass flow rate, which I don't have to make a distinction between incoming and exiting because it's just one mass flow rate, so I just call it m dot. And then here I would have the enthalpy of the flow going into the turbine, which is H3, and then the enthalpy of the fluid coming out of the turbine. So that would be uh, my first law. Let's make another assumption. Um, which is, let's assume the turbine is adiabatic. So we, we insulate our turbine so we minimize any heat losses. That's very common in practice. So we can cross this out by saying that we're going to take our turbine to be adiabatic. So what we have really is an expression that is typically used to find then the power that is produced by the turbine. So we can write then that the power that comes out of the turbine, which is this W dot 3, 4, is simply the mass flow rate times the difference in enthalpy between inlet and outlet of the turbine. We have that. So if I happen to know the mass flow rate and the states 3 and 4, then I have a way to calculate the power. Then I can make another note here, which is this is the real turbine. But if I write the same equation, but now for the ideal one, for the reversible turbine, then I can write W turbine um, ideal would be equal, everything would be the same except the exit. Right? Because the exit, instead of being 4, would be 4s. So this is the ideal turbine. And I can compare those two. And of course, which one will be larger? Which one will be larger? Ideal. The ideal one, because we already know that, that irreversibilities will always work against us. So the real turbine will have less power output. And we can see that much better in another diagram. So that's what I want to do next. Let's look at this on a different diagram, which is obvious which one it should be, just from looking at those equations. What should I plot? Which two properties should I plot? What versus what? No? Not, you said pressure versus entropy? No? There's another one that kind of jumps at you if you look at those equations. Anybody? 
Enthalpy? No. Enthalpy on the vertical axis, what should I put on the horizontal axis? Entropy. Keep the entropy there. So simply instead of putting T, uh, TS, we do another plot, which is HS. And in fact, this plot is so common that it has a name. It's called a Moliere diagram. Enthalpy versus entropy. We saw uh, an actual real Moliere diagram a while back. Let me see. Yeah, here it is. I showed you this uh, probably sometime last week. It's a real Moliere diagram enthalpy versus entropy for water with actual numbers. <clears throat> And one of the things that I told you is that it is very useful uh, when you're dealing with the superheated or high quality side of the uh, liquid vapor uh, mixture. If you're dealing with compressed liquid, then a real one is not as useful because all the compressed liquid data is kind of crunched uh, there on the lower left. But uh, at least for the turbine, which operates in this region, it is very useful. So, but let's make a schematic of what this might look like. So as you can see, the dome gets kind of crooked. Um, you actually, the, uh, the critical point gets shifted somewhere down here. But uh, anyway, what is important to me now is perhaps to look at this side of the dome. So that's all I'm gonna draw. So I'll have the um, saturated vapor side of, of the dome. Let's label this. This is saturated vapor, right, that line. And if we simply look at the previous uh, sketch, we know that we have to start somewhere superheated. And I can put that pressure. You can see those pressure lines uh, go all the way because of the shift of the dome, they actually go in and stay more or less with the same direction. So. If I put uh, pressure lines here, that look something like this. This will be my high pressure, perhaps, and this will be my low pressure. So this is the pressure in the boiler, and this is the pressure in the condenser. And if we try to replicate this on this diagram, then three might be somewhere there. And then 4S is straight down it's for the same reason that it was straight down here because of the constant entropy. So this would be 4S, whereas the real 4 is actually superheated. So the real 4 might be somewhere there. That's the real process. So that's what this... Um, turbine process, the process through the turbine, will look like on this Moliere diagram. <laughs> and this also makes very obvious what we said a moment ago, which is that the work in the ideal case is larger. The power is larger because you can see how if we write the work per unit mass instead of the total power, so if we write um, W, lowercase, which is W dot divided by M dot, that's nothing but H3 minus H4 for the real one. And for the ideal one is H3 minus H4S. And I can see it right here, because if I now look at the vertical distance, if I look at this distance, right? That distance there is the ideal work, right? this one. This is W ideal. 
right? because that's H3 minus H4S. Whereas the real work is the vertical distance between H3 and H4. So if I draw another dashed line here, then this one is the actual work. And you can see that it's less on the Moliere diagram. So then what we do is, well, we have these two quantities that are important for us, the real work per unit mass coming out of the turbine and the ideal one that would be obtained if the process were ideal or isentropic. And then we define something that we call the efficiency of the turbine or the isentropic efficiency of the turbine. Let me write here also that W uh, S, the ideal one, is H3 minus H4S. So again, this is ideal, this is real. So we define something that we call the isentropic efficiency of the turbine call it eta sub t, and that's simply this ratio of this work. So the uh, real one, which is smaller, divided by the ideal one, or in terms of the uh, enthalpies, H3 minus H4 over H3 minus H4s. <laughs> Come up with this quantity called the isentropic efficiency. Not to be confused with the cycle efficiencies that we studied earlier when we started looking at, um, at the second law of thermodynamics, the efficiency of a cycle as a whole, right, as the ratio of the power output divided by the heat input. That's a different efficiency. Same name, but a completely different animal. So this is called the isentropic efficiency of the turbine. Questions? Okay. Let's look at the second law, which in fact will reaffirm some of these um, findings. Just like I wrote the first law here earlier, I want to write an equation for the second law. So if I do that, for this turbine, second law, again steady state so what do I have? <clears throat> uh, remember uh, the way we would write it would be uh, in the full form would be ds dt for the control volume equals q dot over t plus the rate of entropy generation plus m dot S coming in, which is 3, minus S coming out, which is 4. So again, it's steady. We can um, neglect the time derivative. And we assumed already earlier that it was isentropic. I mean, sorry, that it was uh, adiabatic. So we can put that to 0. So adiabatic, this one is because it is steady. This one is because it is adiabatic. So we're left with this, which would, of course, be a way to, for us, if we wanted to calculate the entropy generation, then we have a way of doing it, if we know the uh, states 3 and 4. Now, for the ideal turbine, 
What does this equation tell me? It tells me something that I already know. For the ideal turbine, what do I know? There is no entropy generation, and therefore, S3 equals S4, which we knew, right? So for the ideal turbine, S dot generation is 0, which implies that S4 is equal to S3. Of course, what we should do is call that S4S, right? because that would be, of course, in agreement with any of the charts that we um, we look at that again. We already knew that. From 3 to 4s, there is no change in entropy. And of course, for the uh, real one, there is a difference. Right? So for the real turbine, there is a difference. And that difference, of course, is due to the entropy generation. And since the entropy generation is positive, then of course, that means that S4 is larger than S3. So we can write here that for the real turbine, S dot generation is always greater than 0, which is going to make S4 greater than S3. We already knew that <clears throat> when we were doing the, um, the plots. OK, so that's the turbine. Let's see what's happening uh, with the pump. So the pump, remember, let me go back to the um, original. The pump is right there. It's more or less the same, except that now we're going uphill in pressure. We're going from the low pressure to the high pressure. But if we write the equations, first and second law for the pump, they're the same equations. So if I just, for example, if I look at this equation that I have there, so now let's do the pump. Uh, if I write the first law, Then um, using the same equation but the new uh, subscripts, then I would have, let's assume again that it's adiabatic. So let's say right here, steady, steady flow, adiabatic. Then I have uh, zero, okay. left hand side is zero. The uh, heat transfer is zero. And then the work is minus the power to drive the pump is now from 1 to 2. And then plus m dot incoming enthalpy, which is h1, outgoing enthalpy, which is h2. And if I write the second law, under the same assumptions, then I have 0. We can, of course, see that here again if we look at the second law. 0 for the time variation of entropy, 0 for the heat transfer term. So all we have is S dot generation plus M dot S1 minus S2 which are very similar equations, but with different subscripts. So now I can, from the first one, if I want to find the um, work per unit mass in the pump, which is W1, oops, W12 capital divided by M dot, that's simply H1 minus H2. And the ideal one, W pump S, right, for the ideal case, is, of course, H1 minus H2 S. Real work 
and ideal work. All right. <clears throat> Which one is larger? This time is the opposite. So this time the real one is the larger of the two. Because if we again think of a Moliere diagram, remember everything takes place on the left side. Well, I'm starting from the saturation line, but I'm going to compress liquid state, either 2 or 2S. So if I simply look at that, and I think of it in terms of a Moliere diagram, H, S, then I have, say that this is one, right? the adiabatic process takes me to 2S, but the real process takes me to 2. I can put that isobar there. That line is the pressure in the boiler. So it is obvious that if we look, do the same thing that we did before and we look at the vertical distance, that this one is the W ideal and this one is the real work. Right? So same type of analysis using a Moliere chart, HS, but on the pump side of the cycle. So if I now want to define the efficiency, the isentropic efficiency of this pump, what is it? Isentropic efficiency of the pump, let's call it eta sub p. How should I define it in terms of the work? Ratio of which works? If I do real over ideal, what kind of numbers will my efficiency be? Greater than one, which is not too nice. It's better to, to do the other ratio, right? To do the ideal over the real, because the real is larger. So this gives me a, a number that is less than one, which is easier to identify in terms of how good that pump is. So of course, in terms of the enthalpies now, this is H um, one minus H two S over H one minus H two. That gives me a number that is less than one. Suppose I had a completely, are there any questions? Suppose I had a different cycle, not a power cycle, but a refrigeration cycle, which we have also seen earlier. Remember, if I have a refrigeration cycle, then I, first of all, I run it the other way. It's still a vapor liquid cycle. But what I have on the left-hand side is a compressor. So I would have a compressor here. Which requires some power to drive it. Then I have the condenser up here. <coughs> then an expansion valve to drop the pressure to the evaporator pressure and then 
the evaporator here. All right, so this would be um, a refrigeration cycle. It would take heat at the um, evaporator, what we were calling the QL, and it would reject heat in the condenser. So that would be <laughs> this cycle. <clears throat> but the only point that I want to make is that in this case, I would be dealing with a vapor that I'm compressing in the compressor. I'm bringing it to the uh, low pressure in the evaporator to the high pressure in the condenser. But if I look at a Molière diagram for the compressor, then it really looks, qualitatively speaking, the same as the Molière diagram for the pump. Because if I do that here, compressor, and I put enthalpy versus entropy, and I draw my two pressures, so I have the um, pressure in the condenser and the pressure in the evaporator, then my compressor, let's put some numbers here. Let's say that we called uh, this one and this two for the states. Then this is one, this is two S, but the real exit from the compressor would be somewhere over here. So this is two. And like I said, in a qualitative sense, that diagram is just like this diagram. But the one on top, which is for the pump, is for a liquid. And the one on the right, which is for the um, compressor, is with a vapor. But it has the same features. And therefore, it makes sense to define the efficiency the same way. So we can define the efficiency of the compressor pretty much the same way we define the efficiency of the pump. We would do the, um, uh, this, the small one, which is the ideal one, WS on the numerator and the real one in the denominator. Or in terms of the enthalpies, it would be H1 minus H2S. They happen to be the same numbers as we use for the pump, H1 minus H2. Because I use the numbers 1 and 2 for the um, inlet and exit of, in the compressor. So there you have three so-called isentropic efficiencies for three devices, for the turbine, for the pump, and for the compressor. They're all related to each other because it's in terms of real work and ideal work. There is one more that is good for you to know, which is for another device that we haven't really done a lot with, but uh, that you should know a little bit about. And that other device is a nozzle. So if we think of a nozzle, Again, operating in st same, same assumptions. It's operating in steady state, and we can assume that it is adiabatic. The purpose of that nozzle is to increase the kinetic energy of the flow. So it might look something like this. There is um, a flow going in with a low kinetic energy, but it's coming out here with a much larger kinetic energy. But again, we can assume that this nozzle is operating in steady state and that it is adiabatic. 
So we can neglect heat losses from the nozzle and it's operating in steady state. <clears throat> so we're going to write the first law again for this case, but we have to be careful. Because if I, for example, if I look at this equation that I had a moment ago for the turbine, that equation right there on top, um, this would be fine, this would be the same. I, it's steady state, so I don't have anything here. Uh, I'm assuming that it's adiabatic, so there, would, there wouldn't be any heat transfer. But what about the work for the nozzle? Rigid nozzle. There's no work. Okay. So if I go through that same equation, then I'll find zero on the left, zero for the heat transfer, zero for the work, and then H3 equals, or H1 equals H2. Inlet enthalpy equals exit enthalpy. That's because something is missing. There is something that I neglected in that equation that I should not neglect now. Not internal energy? What? Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy because that's the whole purpose of the nozzle. So I need the kinetic energy terms uh, for the flow terms. So I will have to take that equation, and uh, let me write here the left-hand side is zero. The heat transfer is zero, just so you know that those, we're still putting those to zero. No work, but then when I come here, I have m dot, Inlet is H1, but now I have to add the kinetic energy. And this is kinetic energy per unit mass. So I would do one half of the inlet velocity square. So V1 square over 2. This V is velocity, not volume. And then at the exit, so the enthalpy at the exit, and of course the kinetic energy at the exit. So this kinetic energy terms, which we typically neglect in most of the other devices that we deal with, we should not neglect them when we're dealing with the nozzle. However, as I told you, the purpose of the nozzle is to bring the fluid from a low kinetic energy to a high kinetic energy. So one of these two I can, in fact, neglect most of the time which is the inlet one. That will be small uh, compared to the outlet one. So this, is, this one can be neglected in many problems. But obviously, I should not neglect the second one because that's, in fact, what I want out of that turbine. So then I can write that the, if I solve for that one, that the exit kinetic energy per unit mass is in fact then equal to H1 minus H2. All right. So I can find the, my exit kinetic energy if I neglect the initial, the inlet kinetic energy, again by the difference in the enthalpies. Uh, what would the second, this is first law, I didn't put it here, but this is first law. What about the second law? Well, the second law is the same as before because the second law doesn't have any terms involving kinetic energy. So if I look at, if I want the second law, I can go back to that equation and it will be the same as before. So from the second law, I would conclude that if this uh, nozzle were ideal, I would have S2 equal to S1, right? But if the nozzle is real, then of course the exit entropy should be larger. Right? So I could do a Molière diagram, it would look exactly the same for example, as the one we did for the turbine. And then I could define an efficiency, like I did for the other devices. I can define the isentropic efficiency of a nozzle 
Which kinetic energy is this time larger, the ideal or the real? Which one? Real. The real kinetic energy larger than the ideal? <laughs> that would be very nice. But it's the, right, it's the opposite. So I form the ratio then with the uh, real one. Let's call it that. This is V2 squared, right? Divided by the kinetic energy. Let's call this one 2S, right? Which is the ideal one. Yeah, I define the efficiency of this nozzle, the isentropic efficiency of this nozzle this way. And then if I write it in terms of the enthalpies, of course, it'll be H1 minus H2 divided by H1 minus H2S. That's, in fact, the same equation that we obtained for the turbine. We compare that to the turbine, the right hand side, it's the same. Remember, three and four were inlet and outlet. One and two are inlet and outlet. But of course, this completely different device, completely different thing. For the nozzle, we're just looking at that schematic and we're looking at kinetic energy, at the output kinetic energy that we get out of the nozzle. Okay, still no questions? Yes, finally, a question. So, since we defined that uh, kinetic, uh, kinetic energy is defined as H1 minus H2, right? But then for the real well, that's, is, We don't define it that way, it comes out of the first law. Right. Um, so, for the real case, H2 is uh, greater than H1, right? Uh, yeah, it look, because it would look. It would look like this. It wouldn't look different from this. Except that this would be 1 and this would be 2 and 2s. Two My question is. So is the memory where you're interested is in the difference? Does the velocity be imaginary? Because you have to take the square root of the negative. Oh, no. No, it wouldn't be. Uh, see, the inlet is going to be higher than the exit. Yeah, just like it was for the turbine. So if I do the, let me, even though it's kind of repetitive, let me do the Molière diagram here for this case. It would look like this, H, S, and then I would have this in the same. Here is the inlet, one, right? Here is the two S, and here is the two. Okay. Right. So, because think about it in terms of conservation of energy. Yeah, think think in terms of the conservation of energy. This equation here is just conservation of energy. Right. So, the, the, you convert in some of the enthalpy that you come in into kinetic energy. So therefore, your exit enthalpy is less. Right? It's just that the conservation of energy here uh, is in terms of enthalpies and kinetic energies. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, can you explain like, conceptually how taking the square root of the difference of enthalpies gives you a velocity? Well, look at the units. Right? You don't believe it? You do it. Right? So this enthalpy is energy, right? Enthalpy will have units of energy, say kilojoules per kilogram, right? Right? And velocity square, which is the other unit that you're concerned with, is meter square per second. Right? Second square. What do you get? There's only a factor of a thousand, right? Because I'm writing it, I'm writing it in kilojoules, 
So really, to be precise, if I want to use the SI unit, I should write it in joules per kilogram. Right? Not kilojoules per, kilo, per kilogram, but joules per kilogram. You don't believe that these are equal? Work it out. See, I told you somebody was going to fall asleep in the front. <laughs> so uh, if you work those out, break down your joule, right? Newton per meter, break down the Newton, you'll get that they are the same. So the only thing you have to be careful, in a way I'm glad you asked the question, the only thing you have to be careful with is that if you're writing the enthalpies in kilojoules, you will need a factor of 1,000 when you're doing the numbers to make the conversion. From, because this is 1,000 a thousand of these. Right? All right? You won't be satisfied until you work it out, but you should, you should work it out. Any other questions? You can do, even do it in your head. Joule is Newton per meter. I mean, Joule is yeah, Newton per meter. Newton is kilogram per meter over second square. Cancel all the things that cancel out. You come out with meter square per second square. Any other questions? Okay, let's see. Um, I think we have time to do uh, a, at least one problem using some of these concepts. See if I can do one simple problem, and then um, tell you one another thing. Okay, so here's the problem. This is a very straightforward problem uh, for a steam turbine. So here's my steam turbine. Let's call the inlet one and the outlet two. And we have some data. So we have for the inlet, we have a temperature of 300 Celsius and a pressure of 600 kilopascals. And for the, so this is one. And for the outlet, two, we have a, we have saturated vapor at 20 kilopascals. Right. And the question is very simple. Given this data, what is the efficiency of this turbine? It's a straightforward problem because the states at the inlet and the outlet are completely defined. So we know that at the inlet, 300 Celsius and 600 kilopascals as two independent intensive properties. <laughs> and at the outlet, we know it's saturated vapor at 20 kilopascals. So that's like saying quality equals one and pressure equals 20 kilopascals. That's two intensive independent properties. So those states are completely defined. And maybe the first thing we should do is the Moliere diagram. So if we put H S and say here is the dome, and then I put my two pressures. So here is the high pressure, which is 600 kilopascals and here's the low pressure, which is 20 kilopascals. I know that the outlet is right here. Saturated vapor, right on the saturated vapor line. That's the actual two. All right. So where should one be? To the right of two? 
Think again. The process is from 1 to 2. Right? So 2 has to be to the right of 1. Because the increase in entropy from 1 to 2, not from 2 to 1. So 1, but we know, it's, we, you, by now, you probably should know that those numbers ring of superheated. So it'll have to be superheated, but maybe somewhere here. All right? And then I can draw the rest of the, um, in particular, I can put my uh, 2s, because I know that the isentropic expansion would take me to 2s, whereas the real expansion takes me to 2. <clears throat> so once I've done that Molière diagram, then in this case, I am pretty much done because I can just now go to the table and get all the data that I need to finish the problem. So in particular, if I go to the um, superheated table, I can read my um, data at 300 Celsius and 600 kilopascals. So state one, I go to the table and I read, uh, what should I read? Enthalpy, and I think I have the number here somewhere. 3062. And I should read also the entropy at the inlet, and that is 7.372. All right, so I get those two from there. All right, so now uh, I could also read data at two, because that's completely defined at um, 20, uh, quality equals one, 20 kilopascals. So I can read H2, which of course is HG, right? HG at 20 kilopascals. And if you go to the table, you find that that's 2610 kilojoules per kilogram. All right? OK, um, so how do I find 2s? I'll need to find 2s. Yes? Okay, very good. So it's isentropic, like you're saying. So I know that S2S has to be S1. So I know that. Right? And I know that I am at 20 kilopascals, because that's the same pressure line. So I need this entropy at 20 kilopascals. And what do you think will happen? That if I go to the table, as the Molière diagram makes it very obvious, because 2 is saturated vapor, there is no choice for 2S but to be a mixture of liquid and vapor. Right? It has to be. So in fact, when you go to um, the table at 20 kilopascals, you read your SF. And that number is 0 0.832. I'll skip the units for now, but it's the same as the other units of entropy. And if you read um, your, I didn't write it down, but if you read your S sub G, it'll be larger than that number. Right? And therefore, that's what tells you that, um, that this is a mixture. So, Let's just read SFG, and SFG is 7.908. So what that allows me to do then is find the quality at this ideal exit state. So I can find X2S, right? 
as S2S minus SF over SFG right? from the definition of quality. And I have all the numbers that I have read in the table. And I get this quality to be 0 0.92. So as the Molière diagram indicates, it, ha it is close to the saturation line, but it is a mixture. So now that I have this quality, what should I do next? Hmm? Get the enthalpy at 2s, right? also from the definition of quality. So now I can get H2S is HF plus X2S HFG. I can read all of that in the table. This is all at uh, 20 kilopascals. Right? So you read your HF, you read your HFG, and then you find H2S, which is um, 2431 kilojoules per kilogram. So now you have all the numbers that you need to find the efficiency, because remember the efficiency being the real work uh, divided by the ideal one will be H1 minus H2 over H1 minus H2S. And I have all the numbers. And therefore, I plug everything in. And this gives you 0.72. So 72% efficiency, isentropic efficiency for that turbine, which is typical. Typical isentropic efficiencies of turbine, turbines will be anywhere from 70% to as high as 90%, maybe even a little bit more. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so that's a, that's a straightforward problem. Uh, any questions? Yes? Is that a general question about these sort of problems? Of, will we always assume that it's like steady state and adiabatic? Uh, most of these problems uh, where you're looking at the operation of a device will be steady state problems. Whether it's adiabatic or not depends. I mean, the problem might tell you that you know, it's adiabatic. Um, so the, the answer is. It's only experience that tells you what to do. If, the pro if, you, if you're dealing with a problem, the problem statement might give you a hint as to what you're doing. Clearly, all of these problems involving isentropic efficiencies are steady state problems. And as you have seen, we've defined them all in terms of uh, adiabatic processes. So unless the problem tells otherwise, uh, if you're dealing with a problem of this kind, that would be typically what you would assume. Any other questions? Yes. For the cycles? Yeah. No, it's, this is a different, like I said, it's a different animal. It has the same name, efficiency, but the, do not confuse it with the efficiency of the cycle, right? So suppose that I want to find the efficiency of the cycle in which this turbine is operating. Then I only have, um, the, I have the real work, so I know that the work, which is H1 minus H2, I can calculate that, the work per unit mass. What else do I need to find the efficiency for the cycle in which this turbine is operating? I need the Q in. So I would have to look at another part of the cycle, the boiler. Right? I would have to look at the boiler. Right? Here's my boiler. And find my Q in, or if I want it per unit mass, you know, the lowercase Q in. And then the efficiency that you're talking about is the work, right? I have to be careful. I'm going to have to write net here and then Q dot in, right? Because what I have here, what we just calculated, well, we didn't explicitly calculate it. We can write this per unit mass, so this could be, I'm sorry. This could be W net over Q in, if I, do, if I do it per unit mass. 
This is the work per unit mass that comes out of the turbine, but it's not the network out of that cycle. Why? What is the network that comes out of the cycle, like the one we've been looking at? Uh, that's true. That's true. Q, H, the, uh, minus QL. But in terms of the work, it's not the work out of the turbine divided by Q in. Something is missing. Huh? The pump, right? Because you need to do some work at the pump. So the network that you get out is the work produced by the turbine minus the work required by the pump. So in this problem that we just solved, we're just looking at the turbine. We're getting the efficiency of the turbine regarding the production of this WT. But if we want to get this efficiency of the whole cycle, we need to look at the pump separately and see how much work the pump requires. Need to look at the boiler to see how much heat is required. So that, that, would, that means I have to look at the whole cycle. We can uh, look at a problem involving the whole cycle maybe next, next time so we can look at the, all the uh, devices uh, separately. OK, uh, any other questions? Let me show you one more thing today. In fact, it has to do with the calculation of the work at the pump. And there is a nice, handy equation that we can derive that is uh, very valuable. <clears throat> I'm not going to start deriving as it, if, as it is for a pump, but at the end of the derivation, I'll make some simplifications that will make it specific for a pump. And so. For, for the time being, I'll just think that it's a device. So that has an inlet and an outlet. Let's call them um, let's call them one and two instead of I and E. This is easier, I guess. But this is a, this is a device that um, may or may produce work or may receive work or may also have heat transfer coming in and coming out. So I'm not going to neglect those um, to begin with. So I could have a Q in or out. I sketched it in. And I could have some work in or out. I'm not going to neglect those. I will make assumptions, though. I will um, say that this is a steady state device. All right. I will neglect neglect kinetic energy, potential energy variations. Right? And I will make an, a crucial assumption. I'll assume that it's reversible. So I'll assume that it's ideal. That's, that's important to keep in mind. Of all these assumptions, perhaps, the one that is more, has more of an impact is that it has to be reversible. So, with those assumptions in mind, what's the first law? By now, you should be able to recite it without looking at it. Steady states are 0. I'm going to write it uh, per unit mass. So Q minus W. I, I'm not neglecting those. And then, of course, the enthalpy in, out. Same equation that we've used today, uh, but written per unit mass. OK, now second law. It's reversible, right? So there is no entropy generation. That means that if I write it, for example, in um, differential form, I have ds equals dq over t. The next term, I mean, in fact, let's write it here for the purpose of um, this exercise. There would be some delta entropy generation there, but I'm saying it's reversible, so that's gone. So I can simply write then dq equals tds. 
And uh, I'll use one more relationship from somewhere early in the notes. One of the property relations that we derive, remember, we derive two property relations. So I'm just going to take one of them, the one that has enthalpy. So that one was T dS equals dH minus V dP. So I'm going to take these three things. First law, in fact, let's label them one, two, I'm going to use this form, and three. First law, second law for a reversible process, and one of the property relationships. All right, so um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this TDS between 2 and 3. So I can write that DQ right, is just DH minus VDP right? by combining the last two. Right? But to eliminate the TDS, I can write that. And then I'm going to integrate this from the inlet of the device to the outlet of the device. So if I integrate this, of course, the delta Q will integrate to Q. The dH will integrate to a delta H between inlet and outlet. So it'll be H2 minus H1. And the last term, I have to be very careful because I have to do an integral from inlet to outlet of the dP. So simply integrating that equation. And now this one, okay, I'm going to use to, re to eliminate the Q in the first equation. So I'm going to take this equation to the first one that I wrote, to the first law. And that will allow me to get rid of the Q. So if I replace that Q uh, that appears there with this, you can see, in fact, since you're going to insert H2 minus H1 there, it's going to cancel, right, with the H2, with the H1 minus H2 that appears there. So once I do that, I will have the left-hand side is zero. Uh, I will have the integral from one to two of VDP, right? But the enthalpy, the enthalpy terms all disappear, minus W. So what I have come up with, if I solve for W, is an interesting way to calculate the work that is either produced by this device or required by this device, depending on whether that work comes out to be positive or negative. Um, and it's curious because when we were looking at the work done by a, at a moving boundary, the traditional form of work in the piston is moving, that's always the integral of PDV. Right? So this one is curious because it's the integral of VDP, and also because there is that minus sign there. So do not confuse them. There are no, at least in the, there might be some moving parts inside, but I'm looking at this work as work that comes out, perhaps because there is a rotating shaft um, coming out, or that there is a rotating shaft that is producing work into this device. But like I said at the beginning, where this becomes really useful is when you're dealing with a pump. Because if you're dealing with a pump, you're dealing with a liquid. And if you're dealing with a liquid, what happens to that specific volume that appears there? It's nearly constant when you're dealing with it. So I can, in that case, I can take it out. So now I say liquid. So if it is liquid that is going through that device, as C would be the case for a pump, then I can take that V out, right? Take it as a constant. And then I just have the integral from 1 to 2 of dP, which of course is P2 minus P1. And if I want to get rid of the sign, the negative sign, then instead of writing P2 minus P1, I write P1 minus P2. And then I have a really handy way to find the work produced by a pump. Right? But go back to this. This is reversible. 
So the proper thing to do is to call this work the value S. Right? It's a reversible work. But it will, it will give me an alternative way to find the work pre, uh, done by a pump. If we go back to the example that we, when I define the isentropic efficiency of the pump, right, we're doing this, that would, be, that would give me a, an, an alternative way to find this. Remember, this WPS is the WS, which I, of course, this is in terms of, in terms of the enthalpies. H1 minus H2S, which I would have to go read somewhere in a table. But this one is very handy because normally I would have those pressures to begin with. Right? You know, I would have the lower pressure, the high pressure, and those numbers. I don't need to go to any table. The only thing I need to do is plug in the specific volume of the liquid water, which as you know very well, for most problems, water will be about 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters per kilogram, because the density is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So this will be very handy. And uh, next week, I'll work on some problems and maybe using some of these things. OK, so I will see you uh, next week. <laughs>